for, for a long time, people thought that the way allogeneic bone marrow transplant worked was you just got a very high dose of drugs which killed the marrow and killed the leukemia or whatever, mm -hmm. and then you rescued the patient by giving them the marrow back. Then I think probably when, when people started analyzing what the outcome was of individuals with graft-versus-host disease, they found that people who had graft-versus-host disease actually overall had a much lower rate of relapse than patients who didn't have graft-versus-host disease. And then sort of almost simultaneously with that, the programs of T-cell depletion came into play, in which T-cells were deliberately removed from patients so they no longer got graft-versus-host disease. And those patients in some diseases had a very high rate of relapse. And if you gave those patients donor lymphocyte infusions, which contained T-cells, sometimes the relapse would go away. So then it became you know, suddenly the penny dropped that the way the graft was working was not by rescuing the patient from high-dose chemotherapy, but by actually doing something active and eradicating the leukemia. So then the challenge was how do you extend that to other diseases right. and how do you separate graft-versus-tumor from graft-versus-host disease? There's a lot of antigens to find, and I think what, what's happening is we're getting much better at making T cells that recognize them and that are, have the potency to kill the targets. Now, I think just getting T cells that are potent and able to recognize targets is one stage, but we're obviously then going to have to do several other things which will include develop countermeasures to the various strategies the tumors use to evade the immune system. And some of those are like having a very dense stroma into right. which the, even T cells can't penetrate. Other things are secreting inhibitory factors or right. factors that switch a cytotoxic T cell to a regulatory T cell or, or a, right. a helper T cell and so on. So right. I think that that's going to be the next stage. If you were to um, uh, project a little bit into the future, uh, do you see a role for uh, stem cell engineering and uh, treating uh, cancers in this way? Yeah, I think that there's already people who are looking at introducing T cell receptors and other things into stem cells. Uh, uh, I, I think there will be ways of making them into anti-cancer agents. Mm -hmm. yeah. we're, we're sticking with the T cells for the moment, but in principle it could be any cell that could evolve into a effector cell. T cells are obviously only one small component of the immune system. There's probably a lot of other components that are responsible for anti-tumor activity. And if you change a, t uh, a stem cell appropriately, you might be able to produce a whole diverse repertoire of responses. One local regulator and one federal. I mean, certainly in the states. Obviously, the states are never, individual states and institutions are never going to give up all their rights to the federal government. Uh, but, you know, you could do it all with one, one regulatory entity uh, at the local level and one at the federal level. I mean, really, that's all it needs. And if you want to have a public component in it, that's fine. I have no problem with that. Pay as you go is really something that you do when you're trying to develop the product in terms of it being licensable. And that means that instead of having to carry all the costs of manufacturing, which are considerable for complex biologics, you can recoup that uh, as you're going along. And the, and the two ways that you can do that are a, a cost recovery program where you actually charge the third party pair or the individual patient for the cost of manufacturing, not the cost of development, but the cost of manufacturing. That's obviously irrelevant for most small molecules, but for complex biologics which have a significant manufacturing cost, that can that can recoup um, a substantial amount of your of a cost that would otherwise be lost. And then the second way of doing it is um, is by using the uh, case rate basis on which many procedures are performed now. So, for example, for each stem cell transplant, we might get one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And the third party payer doesn't mind how we spend that, provided our outcomes meet their, their level of requirement in terms of survival and morbidity and so on. So what we do instead of sending money to the pharmacy to buy small molecule drugs or antibodies is we send money to the GMP to manufacture cytotoxic T cells, which we can then give to the patients, which protect them from these virus infections so they don't have to get uh, the antibodies and small molecule drugs. Nice. So it's uh, pay as you go. And then the pay as, uh, pay as you play is based on what we assume will be the survival advantage of these agents versus conventional therapy. And the obvious example is hemophilia, where a single dose of a, of a viral vector might protect you against uh, bleeding for five years, say, in which time you would normally use perhaps half a million dollars worth of, of clotting factor. So in that case, you could price the, the uh, 
cost of the vector per year for every year that you don't have to use clotting factors. So the insurance company, the third party payer, will pay so much per year uh, that you didn't use the, uh, oh, I see. the, the clotting factor. Now for cancer, as we get better and better at predicting how long patients are going to live with each type of tumor, you can look for adjusted uh, life years. So each additional year of survival, the insurance company can agree in advance to pay uh, the money. And there's, there's other factors that will come into that in terms of you know, how much money did the insurance company normally have to pay for the patient to be admitted to hospital because of the toxicity of, of drugs and the failure of drugs and um, palliative procedures and all those other things that hopefully would go away. So I think that if you do these cost analyses, these comparative effectiveness analyses, you can come up fairly quickly with just what these drugs, these, these complex biologic agents cost overall compared to conventional therapy. And then that difference can be factored into reimbursement.